do you know right from wrong? How do you know? Because someone else told you? Or because you figured it out for yourself? Do you always follow other people's ideas of what you should do? Probably not. Or maybe you do, without realizing it. You don't have to, though. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. People have a variety of opinions on right and wrong, but they don't always know where those opinions come from. They say you shouldn't lie or steal or hurt people, always help out, etc., etc. Is that what they do? No, no, it's what other people should do. For me, no, I, I lie or steal or use violence when it's in my interest. After all, that's how the really rich and powerful people think. They do those things every day. That's how they reach and maintain their power. And yet, to us, they preach what Nietzsche called a slave morality. Most of our beliefs and values come from other people. On the one hand, that shouldn't be surprising, or even a bad thing. Humans are social creatures that need society. From society comes social institutions and stories. Our beliefs are shared, to some extent, by the people around us. That's what creates culture, shared beliefs and customs. But some cultures are more free, more permissive, more caring and more open-minded than others. That's how we know our own cultures can be better. People can learn to value one thing or another. I think they should choose their own values through self-discovery. But for those who don't, there are plenty of people waiting in the wings to tell them what to think. As Malcolm X said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Morality and all the words and ideas used to moralize are an assertion of power over you. People's use of morality isn't very different from a con. A con takes something from you by appealing to your values. If you value love or money, and most people value both, a con artist can use your desire for more against you. But con artists only take some of your money. The people and institutions who use morality to take from you are playing the long con. They don't just take your money. They take your mind. And most people never find out they've been robbed. The most obvious source of morality is religion. Many parts of the world are strongly influenced by religious morality, particularly the two big ones, Christianity and Islam, whose moral codes at root are pretty similar. And since they've been around telling us how to act for a couple thousand years already, their morality seems universal and self-justifying. Of course you can't have sex before marriage. Of course you're not allowed to be gay. Of course you have to pray every day and abstain from alcohol and so on and so on. Doing anything against the religion is a sin. And sins send you to hell. You should be constantly terrified that something you do will anger God. There are millions of pious people who think this is okay. On an individual level, the problem with all these laws is people break them, while believing it's a sin to break them. I once knew a gay Muslim guy who was convinced he was going to hell because he was gay. Imagine the stress of believing your existence is a sin and your future is hell. Because if you're not cisgender and heterosexual, you're supposed to feel bad. In fact, even today, when we know it doesn't work, people perform conversion therapy because you're not allowed to be what God made you. The repressed emotions and feelings of confusion and guilt lead some victims of conversion therapy to commit suicide. They feel like they'll never be accepted by their family or their community. We've been told the family is paramount and religion is the impartial judge of right and wrong. 
So because modern people are living out ancient people's morality, millions have to suffer. On a social level, these religious laws help keep people in line. Sometimes religion is used to incite rebellion, which is great, but day to day it has the effect of mitigating people's anger at authority. Religious morality is often cited as a pretext for making laws, and of course, if it's a law based on religion, well, it must be a good law. Never mind the people making the laws are total hypocrites. You really think the Saudi royal family and the religious scholars they employ live the principles they force their subjects to follow? Or look how many rich religious and political leaders decry homosexuality to elicit donations and then get caught with male prostitutes. <laughs> Religion is invoked to grant authorities legitimacy for concentrating power by oppressing people. In their hands, religion is nothing to do with right and wrong. It's used to control you. But then, so can anything you don't question. After all, there's plenty of secular morality, too. You've got everything I talked about in last week's video that power uses to legitimize itself, which often amounts to little more than words. Democracy, the Constitution, the law, the country, the economy, and so on. They're all used to make claims about right and wrong, usually whatever claim the speaker wants to make. The word democracy is dragged out to justify any decision a group takes. It's the law. Excused segregation, apartheid, concentration camps still today excuses a million deaths on the war on drugs. The badges and the robes and the titles like officer and your honor are there to make you feel their power over you. They want you to depend on them for assurance that you're doing the right thing, like a dog continually looking back at its owner. But there's nothing inevitable about their rule or your obedience to it. Capitalism, of course, brings its own morality. Capitalist morality doesn't always become law but it's still used by its adherents to tell us what to do. It has its own words and slogans. Work hard, it says. It promises recognition and more pay and more freedom in return, but for most people, it doesn't deliver. They'll throw it in your face. You deserve to be poor if you don't work hard. You deserve pain and suffering because you're not rich, and rich people don't want to help you. Doesn't make any sense. Pay your debts. If you don't, you have to work even harder, under even worse conditions to pay them off. Rich people are benefactors, except what they do is take all the money so that others have to work for them to survive. They tell you it's virtuous to be selfless and work hard and serve others, but they've always used those words to get slaves, serfs, and employees to keep working. Do they serve you? No. It's a hierarchical relationship. You serve them, and they allow you just enough money to survive. The market always demands more of you like harder work, higher rent, higher prices, etc. And we're supposed to just shrug and comply. The economy just won't permit us to raise your wages. But you wouldn't understand because you've never taken economics. Hmm. Economics is largely a pseudoscience devoted to defending capitalism from its critics. It uses graphs and models and theories, so it looks like science. And to the layperson, the appearance of science is the same as truth. We could get into the nature of truth, but I'll confine myself to saying words like science and truth and fact will all be used to tell you what to think. In my experience, truth and value-free science and objectivity and indisputable facts are pretty hard to come by. Everyone says they have them, but an opinion and prejudice often substitute. But they look like truth because there are numbers and impressive websites and glossy journals and, I mean, people with academic titles wrote them. 
It amazes me how easy it is to fool someone with misleading headlines or statistics presented out of context. Sometimes the only justification needed for something is, it's always been this way. Or more accurately, it's the only way I know things have been done. That's called appeal to tradition. Beliefs like nationalism, or its euphemism, patriotism, are appeals to tradition. This is the reality we know, so it's what's right. They're using history to tell you what to do. Talking about countries or races or other poorly defined collectives is often used to appeal to people's sense of selflessness. So you have to sacrifice. Or glory, so you have to fight. Or whatever argument they employ to beat you over the head with colored lines on maps. We're a country, you see, which doesn't necessarily mean anything. We're told what this country supposedly thinks and stands for, but countries don't think and don't stand for anything. They're just another way to control you. We're a country, so you have to follow all our laws and customs. You should fight for your country by doing what the government tells you to. And why do we honor some dead people, but not others? Who decided? These customs and traditions aren't necessarily worth following or preserving. I've watched shaking hands die off in the past year or so. With a lot of luck, next year, obeying the law and dying for the glory of empire will go with it. Of course, sometimes history or tradition can be a point of resistance and unity, like with anti-colonial movements. There's no doubt tradition performs a number of uh, social functions. Just don't let people use it to tell you what to do. History alone is not a good enough reason for you to do something in the present. If we're talking about tradition, I should probably mention the so-called traditional family. It's another of these sacred institutions. All the other ones benefit from this emphasis on the nuclear family, so they make us believe it's an eternal, unbreakable bond. And if you love your family, great. Tell them. But it's also okay to leave abusers, and many abusers are family members or other intimates. They might throw words like family and love at you because you're supposed to value those things, but they might just be using morality to manipulate you like all those other people. Some people really consider your feelings their property. They'll design your whole life for you if you let them. They're the same people who tell you how a man or woman is supposed to act, or how a poor person is supposed to spend their money, or how an immigrant has to act to be allowed anywhere near them. Our supposed duties and obligations all come from someone appearing as an authority. So, along with all these other moral beliefs, we're taught to respect authority itself. When we displease authority or go against any of its moral rules, even if we're on our own, we might feel stress. We might get guilty or anxious. Either way, our lives no longer belong to us. They belong to abstract ideas from a long time ago and the people who use them in the present to control us. We deny ourselves freedom in, and happiness in favor of guilt trips from dead people. Even some supposedly revolutionary circles promote slave morality. Look at how nonviolence is talked about as if its moral superiority were indisputable. Look how protesters distance themselves from anyone the media can get away with calling violent. You're fighting fascists and police. They use violence against you and your people every day. What are you using to defend yourself? None of this is to deny, of course, that there are some natural roots of morality. For example, there's the widespread tendency to reciprocate. You give me a present, I want to give one to you. You punch me in the face, and 
my first impulse is to return the favor. But none of your identifiable human traits should be used to dictate what we should do in any given situation. If someone gives you a present, are you compelled by some natural law to reciprocate? What if they're just doing it to manipulate you? I've given something to you, so now you owe me. Mm. Some people told you what moral values to believe in, and then used them to enslave you. But here's the thing. Even though our thinking is informed by other people's morality, at least until we reject it, we're still going to do what we think is right for ourselves. The law and order types break the law when no one's looking. The people who insist on purely nonviolent resistance live on conquered, segregated land and consume its products every day. People's moralizing rarely takes their own behavior and desires into account. All the hypocrisy makes me think everyone is an egoist in denial. Egoists don't feel compelled to follow someone else's ideas of what's right and wrong. They're aware of them, they'll listen, but ultimately they decide for themselves. An egoist in denial might feel stress and guilt when they're not following the rules, but they still break them for their own benefit. For example, God said I can't do that? Well, I'll just do it this once. The people telling you what to do see it as in their own interest, maybe because they benefit somehow, or maybe just because of some vague idea of society. What they're doing is putting their egoism above yours. They might call it altruism, morality, or the greater good, but you don't have to accept their words as obligations. You can decide right and wrong for yourself. To me, the ultimate arbiter of morality is the conscience. But before you rely entirely on conscience, you might need to exorcise some ghosts. Until you acknowledge and question and discard the slave morality you've been taught, you'll continue to feel guilty for no other reason than because someone told you to. The clearest example of that, to me, is sex. Millions of people feel guilty for having sex. They feel extra guilty about sex without the magical association of marriage, but even when they are married, they're convinced sex is dirty and only to be conducted by sinners for any reason other than to have kids. That's the ghost talking. People from more than a thousand years ago are telling you to feel guilty for doing what feels right. They had their reasons for saying sex is dirty and not allowed. What are your reasons for believing them? And hey, if you know you have an STD and still spread it around, maybe you should feel guilty. But sex alone is nothing to feel bad about. It's okay to enjoy yourself. I think the idea of rights and responsibilities are good examples of social constructs that, in the right conditions, could be in most people's interest. I've made a video about why I don't really believe in rights, because the whole premise behind them seems to be that they're enforceable or even unbreakable. But in the real world, people with a closer connection to power than you, some acting on authority, or maybe just someone with more money than you, they can violate your rights. You can take them to court, but you have to hope your legal team's better than theirs, and that you can afford one. But if you had a purely voluntary community, or any other kind of non-hierarchical organization, you could enumerate certain rights and mechanisms to prevent people from violating them, or deal with it if they do. You could make a community of your apartment building or your neighborhood, and, and you all agree, for example, everyone has autonomy of the body, or whatever the term is, and if you have sex with someone and, the, and they knew they had an STD and didn't tell you, then the adults get together, listen to the facts, and decide what to do. That's kind of what they did in villages in England before the state monopolized dispensing law and punishment. And they took precedent into account, so 
if they did something before, they can refer to it for guidance on what to do this time. In fact, they still do it that way in egalitarian societies the world over. I always hear about rights and responsibilities, and I think they're pretty made up, but on a local, personal level, they could work. Most of the time, people are going to do what they think is right for themselves and the people they care about. I think our consciences should be free of unwanted parasites like moral obligations that don't serve us. Thank you.